Hello, everyone. So we are live on YouTube uh, on a very special meeting. So uh, welcoming everyone. And then I'm giving the floor to Leia and Lisa. So oh, hello, uh, marhaba, um, shalom from Jerusalem. Um, I would like to uh, welcome you in this uh, special event dedicated tonight on the 27th, uh, January 2022, dedicated to the commemoration and the memory of the victims of an unprecedented uh, genocide, total and systematic, with the aim to annihilate um, the Jewish nation, their culture, their heritage. Since 1933 and until the uh, end of the war in 45, and, and especially the day that it is being marked today, it is January uh, 1945, the day that the Red Army liberated uh, prisoners of the Auschwitz camp, among them uh, thousands of Jews. So um, by the end of the war, um, from 33 and until 45, approximately 6 million Jews were murdered. And it is their memory that we have um, gathered uh, here tonight um, to um, honor. Uh, the nations of the world um, in 2005, November 2005, with a resolution voted by the United Nations. Uh, the nations of the world uh, instituted this Memorial Day and thus made a commitment to always remember and never forget. Uh, reminding also uh, to each one of us and us all together to join our voices against forces of hate who at times become bolder and bolder. Um, ours, our generations, it is the last chance that we have to join our voices with those who experienced the events, with the eyewitnesses. And it is our last chance to hear a first-hand account, first-hand account of Holocaust survivors, of, of partisans, of rescuers, of righteous among the nations. Witnesses who recall and recount uh, the, the events in the most humane, undiluted and immediate way. Tonight with us, we have the honor to have Mr. Peter Rosenfeld Spahn. I will introduce him uh, to you in a while. And before that, uh, I will thank very much uh, both um, Lisa Chemel and Jackie Hazan uh, for this uh, beautiful cooperation uh, with uh, JCC Izmir and uh, newspaper Shalom. Um, thank you for the opportunity uh, of this event tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to be connected with Izmir and, and Turkey, other corners of the country. And Lisa, the floor is yours to welcome our audience. Thank you, dear Lea, for the introduction and also for your support. Uh, in, in making this event possible. Uh, I would also like to say a few words begin, uh, before we begin to hear our special guest. Uh, first and foremost, it is an incredible honor to be able to host you today, Mr. Rosenfeld Sven, on such an important day where we not only say never forget, but dedicate ourselves to the principle of always remember. Because it is, always, it is impossible to forget, but as, but as the next generations, we have a commitment to preserve the memory of our history. And therefore, we really appreciate your presence and your willingness to share. And as Lam mentioned, unfortunately, with the survivors aging and as the pandemic maintains its effects, we are grateful that we managed to gather from all around the world, leaving our differences and conflicts behind in order to unite with the power of story and life. I will make a really short Turkish introduction as well for some of our participants. Herkese iyi akşamlar. Bildiğiniz üzere bu akşam 1938 Belgrad doğumlu Sayın Peter Rosenfeld Spen'i ağırlıyoruz. Unutmamız imkansız ama hep hatırlamak ve hatırlatmak için buradayız. Tüm farklılıkları bir kenara bırakıp birlik oluyoruz. Hem pandeminin getirdiği zor koşullar hem de yaşça büyük survivorlarımızı korumak adına 
Zoom üzerinden buluşabildiğimiz için çok mutluyuz. Bu vesileyle ben hem Şalam Artı 18 hem de Esperta İzmir hem de Yad Vaşam adına konumuza ve siz katılımcılarımıza teşekkür ediyorum. And I will uh, again leave the floor to Leo for um, introducing our guest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. So I will uh, I will introduce I will proudly introduce. We are very honored, Mr. Span, to have you with us. He is getting connected from LA. Uh, these are the good aspects of the Zoom in this world of Zoom fatigue that we all live in. Um, we are hosting him from from Jerusalem and from Izmir. Uh, we are connected to him. Uh, who is in, is in LA at the moment at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I will uh, say just a few words. Uh, Peter Rosenfeld Span, he was born on May 19, 1938 in Belgrade, Yugoslavia, which is nowadays Serbia. Um, as I said, he currently lives in, in Los Angeles. He's a survivor uh, of the Holocaust who spent most of World War II in Hungary. Um, and he was uh, ghettoized, he was in a ghetto, he was sent to um, transit and labor camps during uh, the war, for the whole duration of the war. And he luckily managed to survive. And he has been giving lectures to broad audience in Mexico, Los Angeles, and other places for the past at least 10 years. Please correct me if I'm wrong. And he will talk to us about uh, his, uh, his family, how they managed uh, part of the family to survive life in Hungary and what happened in his family during World War II. I, will, uh, I, I already put a link. Uh, I will um, put it again in the chat room. There is a film that has been done by Yad Vashem uh, and the International School for Holocaust Studies. Uh, dedicated to his uh, life, a testimony film, a documentary. The title of the film is My Mother Told Us Not to Run. It is on YouTube. I'll, I'll again, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat. And it's also in Spanish, as he just told us a few minutes ago, with the title Mi Mama Nos Dijo No Coran. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Um, and the floor is yours. Uh, I will um, invite uh, everyone to uh, put questions, eventual questions, remarks in the chat. Uh, you can write either in English or in Turkish. Lisa will help us with the Turkish language. And uh, Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me, everyone? <coughs> can you hear me okay? <coughs> well, I was born in uh, May 19, 1938, uh, in a very happy family. I'm the youngest of three brothers, and the youngest one is always protected by the older brothers, and also he's the favorite of his parents. So I never had any conflict with my brothers or with my parents. I was a happy child in a happy family, in a very wealthy family. My parents got married in 1930 and they traveled everywhere. They went in a honeymoon, they went to the, the, the south of France, to Nice, to, to lots of places. And then in 1935, they went to Israel, to Jerusalem, uh, I have a picture of them at the Wailing Wall in 1935, together with older people and with women, something you cannot do today. Uh, uh, when I was three years old in April 1941, the Germans bombed Belgrade. And that's when I had my first ever memory, when I was three years old. And I remember that it was very, very noisy. Uh, we had a very large home, larger than any other home on the, on the block. And we were the only house with an underground garage that could fit two or three cars. Uh, and the day of the bombing, my father opened the doors 
to the street. So anybody that was on the street and people on the block could walk into our basement to protect themselves. And my first memory is that I was in the basement with my nurse. I had a nurse. <laughs> and uh, this man ran in with his hands covering his face. When he took off his, his hands, he was all covered with blood. And my mother ran to him and my nurse turned around and took me out of the basement. So I don't, I don't know what happened, what had happened to the man. And then my next memory, I have three years without any memories. Then three years when I was six is when the deportation started. And that's when I started having many memories. Uh, people ask me, how can I remember things when I was six years old? And I tell them, everybody remembers. Some people remember when they're three, four, five, six years old, uh, but there are memories that last 10 seconds, 20 seconds. You remember your first birthday cake. You remember the first time that, that somebody spanked you. You remember, so they are very vivid memories. We don't remember how boring life was, but we do remember very small uh, 10 second or 20 second memories. And most of my memories come from that and stories from my mother, from my older brother and my middle brother. In, uh, after the bombing, Belgrade was filled with German soldiers. And so we went to a, this border city with Hungary, Subotica, where my father and his brothers had the largest uh, hardware store. So we went to Subotica because Subotica was right on the border and it was more Hungarian than, than Yugoslav at that time. And everybody spoke Hungarian and everybody spoke uh, Serbo-Croatian. And we lived there pretty happily until 1944. Before that, before 1944, 1939, my parents decided to make a trip to America to choose their country where they were going to move because they knew that they were not going to stay there forever. And uh, not only that, but they named their three children not with Hungarian names, not with Yugoslav names, not Jewish names. They decided that because they were not going to live the rest of their lives in, in Hungary or Yugoslavia, they named us the most popular names in the world, which are the apostles. So they named us John, Paul, and Peter. And uh, so in 1939, they took a, uh, a cruise ship from the coast of France to New York. And they, in New York, they met old classmates from secondary school in Hungary, the, the Fleshes. And then they went to Mexico. My mother had a brother, her only brother that was living in Mexico since 1932. They fell in love with Mexico. Many years later, my mother said that Mexico City was one of the three most beautiful cities in the world. And she said the three most beautiful cities in the world were Mexico City, Cairo, and uh, Barcelona. Now, Barcelona is still one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Cairo is horrible, and Mexico City, except for downtown, is horrible also. The traffic, the smog, the aggression. So anyway, they fell in love. And on the way back in, in New York City, the Fleshes, their friends told them, don't go back, just send for the children, because we hear that things are very bad in Europe. And 
I don't know if the war already started against uh, Czechoslovakia or it was going to start. And my father said, we have to go back because we have to sell the house. We have to sell the business. We have to sell the car. And so they went back, they came back to Sobotica and they didn't do anything. My father was the younger brother and just like I am the younger brother. And any one of you who is the younger brother knows that the younger ones have no say in any decision. The older brothers decide, decide everything. So they didn't sell the, the, the business, they didn't sell the car, they didn't sell the house. So we stayed there pretty happily until 1944. In 1944, the deportation started. First, they sent us to a ghetto in Subotica to the, near the train station that was just three or four blocks from our house. And we were there in the ghetto, and then from that ghetto, they sent us to another ghetto in a place called Bachalmash, and where we were uh, a month and a half. And then they, uh, we had to board a train, supposedly to Auschwitz. And on the train station, our cousins and our uncles, all the adults were walking very fast. And my mother, because she had three young children, couldn't walk so fast. And she told us, don't run. There's no rush. And because of that, we boarded the, either the last wagon or one of the last wagons of the, of the train. And that's one of the things that saved our lives. The train went, it was usually several days, and the train would stop in the middle of nowhere because the either the allies were already bombing the the, the the train ways and so we had to stop to fix it and we never knew who, when where the train stopped in one of those stops uh the, we couldn't look out the window because the windows were very high and the train stopped and the Two young boys, one lifted the other one and looked out the window and saw people working there. And uh, well, I forgot to tell you that my father was sent to forced labor with a Hungarian brigade two years before, two years before we were taken from 1942. So the boy looked out the window and saw some men working and he turned around and he announced to everyone in the train, out there, there, there are people from Subotica. Who is from Subotica? My mother said, I am. Lift me up. I want to see. And they lifted my mother and she saw my father outside. He was one of the workers out there. And my father said, I want to board a train. I want to go with you. And my mother said, no, you can't. You can because the, the, the wagon is locked and we are being taken to get killed. And you're out there in the open air and you're free. So then, of course, I wanted to see my father also. And they said, okay, we're going to lift you. And when they're about to lift me, uh, the train started advancing again. So I didn't see my father. Uh, I have to tell you that the documentary, which is 35, 36 six minutes long, was taken from three and a half hours of me speaking to a camera and a microphone. And those three and a half hours, I cried at least three times. And the director included all three times in the documentary. And I'm telling you this because I might cry as I'm telling you this story. Uh, anyone can see the documentary on YouTube. If you go into YouTube 
And when, when it says search or the loop, you just write in, mother told us not to run, and the documentary comes up immediately. Uh, the, the Yad Vashem hired a director that had done other documentaries for Yad Vashem. He never met me, I never met him, uh, but he decided what to include in the, in the story, which almost everybody likes. Uh, so we were taken in the train, and in one of the towns, the train was divided in two. The front of the train kept on going to Auschwitz, and the back of the train, where we were, was taken to a, a, a distribution camp called Strasshof near Vienna. And we were in Strasbourg for four days, which were the worst days of my life, because they separated, they separated us from my mother. And it was the first time in my life that I was separated from my mother. So I cried nonstop, grabbing onto my older brother, Ivan. And uh, we would see, we saw my mother at least once, maybe more times, on the other side of a fence, and she would get close to the, to the fence to speak to us, to see us, and the soldier, a German soldier would push her away, so she wouldn't be touching the, the, the fence. So that was even worse. Not only I was separated from my mother, but there was a soldier pushing my mother away. And then uh, from Strasshof, we were taken to a small town, 25 kilometers from Vienna, uh, called Udritzkirchen. And we spent the next nine months in Udritzkirchen, which was a labor camp that uh, we were, I mean, 50 of, The order of the story is, I have to go back. Uh, the mayor of Vienna, this is 1944, the mayor of Vienna requested 30,000 slaves because all the adult Austrian and the adult Germans were either dying in France against the Americans or dying in Russia against the Soviets. So there were no labor to work on industry and agriculture. The mayor asked for 30,000 slaves and uh, Adolf Eichmann was already negotiating with a Jewish leader and he requested the 30,000 and the 30,000 we were among 15,000 of the 30,000. 15,000 were sent to Auschwitz by mistake, and the other 15,000 where we were, were taken to Vienna and, uh, and small villages around Vienna. And we spent there uh, in Udritzkirchen nine months. The adults, they considered that the adults Anybody over 12 years old was considered a, a, an adult and he had to work with the adults uh, in the reshaping of a small stream. Uh, so my mother and a cousin and her older sister that was in the camp with us were going, working all day long uh, and Ivan, my older brother, was with them. And the younger ones, the children, we had to carry water to the kitchen until the cook said, okay, I don't need any more water. So we could go out and play. It wasn't much play because we were hungry all the time. All the food we, we ate was one ladle full of 
a thick soup, which is what they give to pigs. It says thick soup made of cabbage and potatoes. And the adults nicknamed that food Moshlek in, in Hungarian. Moshlek is the, the slop, the dirty water they feed pigs. And uh, my cousin, Evi, who was 21 years old, she would come back from working all day. And she would sit down at the entrance of the, of the barrack. And all the children, six or seven children, would sit around her and she would give us classes because we're not going to school. So she would talk to us about history, about geography, uh, all kinds of stories, like if we were in school. And I loved it. And one day she was talking to us about Tutankhamen. She said that Tutankhamen was so wealthy that his table service was made of gold. And I said, Evi, what is table service? And this, I have never forgotten. She said, uh, Tutankhamen was so wealthy that he ate his moshlek in a golden dish. Anyway, a few months later, uh, we spent the whole winter in Rodriguezkirche. It was freezing cold. And because we didn't have any clothing except the clothes, the one outfit of dirty clothes we had without any changes, in uh, winter, we put newspaper around, your, around our legs and around our uh, bodies under the clothing to protect us from the cold. And let me tell you, it works. Newspaper <laughs> is very good uh, shield from the cold. Uh, a few months later, suddenly the, the chief of the camp disappeared. And a day later, the two couples disappeared also. What's happening? And we were hearing very loud noises of guns. And what was happening is that the German army was retreating because the, the, from the Russians, from the Soviet uh, army. And the Germans stayed, the German soldiers stayed with, oh, stayed with us for two days. To protect ourselves from the fighting, about 100 meters from the camp, there was an underground, uh, uh, how do you say it, where they keep wine, cellar. There was a wine cellar, I don't know, 20 by 20 meters large, where we all went in to protect ourselves. And the Germans stayed with us for two, two days. And I remember that a German soldier, the regular soldiers, they were, Nobody knew the word Nazis. It was German soldiers. One of the soldiers took me and sat me on his, on his legs, on his lap, and he was telling me very nice, he was speaking to me very nicely. And he showed me his wallet where he had a picture of his family, his wife and two children. And, but I didn't understand a word of what he was saying. My mother did know how to speak German, and I asked her, what is this, this soldier telling me? I don't understand. And she said, he is telling you that he misses his son, because you are the same age as his son. Uh, anyway, the Germans left, and then one day we were between two, two fires. Uh, we were very afraid, and one of the young men, 15 or 16 years old, uh, said, now is the time to go to the camp 100 meters away to steal a sack of potatoes for us to eat. 
So several young boys, men, ran to the camp and as they were coming back, my brother Ivan was the first one to arrive and he ran down the steps and then we heard a large explosion and another boy, maybe 15 years old, uh, stumbled down the stairs and my mother ran to him and put he, her arms around him and later on she said that her aunt, her hand went all the way into his back into the wound and the boy died right there falling down the steps uh, when this fighting between two to uh, the two, the Germans against the Russians, when the when it ended, the Russians arrived, and I distinctly remember one thing about the Russians: they wanted watches. All they were screaming all the time, "Davai chas, davai chas, davai chas! Give me watch, give me watch!" Not only we didn't have watches, we didn't have anything. And uh, I remember that the soldiers had, everyone had a watch. And the sergeant had seven watches on, on his forearm. And I was already seven years old and I remember thinking that, I don't think these, these guys know how to read the time. They want the watches, but they don't know how to read them. Uh, the other thing that I remember that not personal memories, but my cousin Avi told me years later that the soldiers would get drunk, the Russian soldier would get drunk, and in the evening they would go down to the cellar and look for the girls. And my mother and the other adults that already knew the tricks said there were no there were no girls here, there's only little boys. So what Evie told me is that they used to lie down the girls on the floor. Put, there were, I don't know how many girls, between 15 and 21. And they would lie them on the floor, put blankets on top. And then on top of those blankets, they would lie us, all the children. And then on top of the children, more blankets. So when the soldiers went down drunk looking for the girls, they would tell them, there were no girls, there, there's no girls here, only little boys. And my mother was, I believe, 37, but she must have looked like 75. Uh, the day after the Russians left, uh, the adults decided that that was immediately we had to leave the camp and go to Bratislava. And the reason they wanted to go immediately is because they were afraid that the Russians would retreat and we would be caught with the Germans again. And so we, we that's another one of my crying days. I remember I cried all day long because we, we walked from seven o'clock in the morning in a rainy day all day long. And at about 11 o'clock in the morning, I saw my first and only dead soldier. Uh, the, the, the adults used to shield us from seeing anything bad. Even in the camp, when one of the older men died, they would not let us see anything. They would put us on one side. But this time, uh, they didn't have time to shield us. So I saw this dead German soldiers covered with brown blood. And I remember thinking, blood is not supposed to be brown, it's supposed to be red. And then I realized that it was dry blood. This, this soldier had been dead for, for a day probably. Then anyway, we took, uh, then we arrived in Bratislava and then uh, American trucks took us to Budapest and trains. We took 14 days from Ulrich back to Sobotica 
a trip that today would take five hours. We took 14 days to get back. And when we got back, uh, it was, uh, how do you say, you couldn't, nobody could be out in the street after eight o'clock in the evening. It was still military time. So we arrived in Subotica at, I don't remember, seven or eight o'clock at night, and they didn't let us go home, which was only a few blocks away, because there was uh, this military order not to, not to be out in the street. So very early in the morning, we walked to the house, and the big question was, my father, is he home? Is he back? And we rang the bell, and it was still dark. And he opened the door, which within a few seconds, he said, I woke up a few, uh, like an hour ago, and I couldn't back, go back to sleep. And so I, I was so happy. We sat in the living room of the house, my father in a sofa, in front of us and my mother and the children the other side and they were telling uh, telling each other what had happened to them uh, in the last two years and I was jumping to sit next to my father and then I would come back and sit next to my mother and then again next to my father I was the happiest kid in the world uh, my father had been beaten many times during forced labor and he had a kidney problem he had to be hospitalized and he he came home three months before we came home and uh, his friends helped him go to a, to a hospital and then they took him from the hospital and they helped him go back to Subotica and in Subotica he had to also check into a hospital and not only he had the kidney problems, but he had a bleeding ulcer. And I remember about him that he would go to the sink and vomit blood. And uh, what happened, this is not in the documentary. The director skipped this <laughs> about the bleeding ulcer. He, the doctors told him, you either operate your ulcer or you will die. And what happened is that he died during the operation. And uh, so I was seven years old. Uh, my mother did the right thing to do. She insisted that we should go to the funeral. And I remember that funeral because it was a horse drawn carriage where the coffin was and we were all walking behind the carriage and people on the sidewalks would take off their hats in respect as we were passing by. Uh, the uncles and adults would tell my mother, don't take the children, don't take the children. And my mother insisted that after what we had gone through, we should see the funeral. Many years later, a psychologist friend of mine told me that was the right thing to do because when you, when you don't see the body getting into the ground, you fantasize the whole, your whole life about what happened to the dead uh, person. Anyway, after that was 1945, uh, and we stayed in Yugoslavia until 1947. In 1947, we were in Belgrade in our big house and the new uh, communist government came to the house and told my mother that the house was too large for one family. Three more families are going to move in with you. And that's when the Jewish princess said, absolutely not. We were going to go to Mexico in 1939, so we're going to go to Mexico now. She sold the house. We got passports, and but we didn't have visas. 
uh, at that time they would give you a passport if you didn't have any property in Yugoslavia. So we sold, my mother sold the house, we got passports and we left and we went to Paris. And we lived in Paris for four months, which is what took my mother to get the American visa and the Mexican visa. And after four months, we sailed again in, oh, in an American ship where cargo ship, not passenger ship, where the sailors would bring baskets filled with oranges and tell, the, tell us, take all the oranges you want. They're all free. I couldn't believe it that, that I could get an orange every hour. Anyway, we arrived in New York, the Fleshes, my mother's uh, friends, went to the dock to receive us. And then uh, we stayed with them for two weeks. And then we took a train to Mexico. And uh, my uncle Andor was waiting for us at the border of Mexico and the US. And he rode with us from the border to Mexico City. We arrived in Mexico City on the 14th of July, 1947. And uh, that's the end of my childhood story. And then why did I survive? Why did I survive? I, in the documentary I mentioned that I, I like to say that I won the lottery seven times, but in the documentary, that's it. They don't say the seven times. So the seven times, I wrote it down because I know five or six by then, but I don't remember all of them. Uh, number one, we were deported in 1944. If we had been deported before 1944, they would have killed me in the first 15 minutes of arrival in any one of the large camps. Uh, all the children and all the men were, and women were killed almost immediately. Then the second one is that we were not sent to a large camp. We were sent to a small, there were still six large extermination camps. Most people don't know that there were only six camps where they exterminated Jews. There were 1,600 small labor camps. We were in one of them. Uh, the number three was don't run. There's no rush. So we stayed at the end of the train. The number four, we were taken to Strashof instead of uh, Auschwitz. And we're, uh, when we were right in Strashof, it was already underway, a negotiation be, being done by Germans and, uh, and Americans and Jews called Jews on Ice or Blood for Goods. The Germans wanted 500 trucks, 5,000 trucks, coffee, tons of food, and lots of money. And there was some money but there was no trucks anywhere. And the Americans would say, uh, even if there were trucks, we would never give them to Germans because they would be used, use them against the Soviets, which are our allies. And uh, that, so uh, we were taking to Vienna and in Vienna, Half of the Jews, half of the 15,000 were to the city of Vienna and the other half to small towns. And the Jews in Vienna, almost every day, the Americans and the British were bombing Vienna. And the Jews could not get into the shelters because they were Jews. And the following day, the, the Jewish children had to go into the rubble and pick out bodies, dead bodies, or pieces of bodies. And I wasn't there. I was in Uritzkirche. Uh, basically, that's the story. Uh, 
One of the things that I have talked about yesterday and the day and the Yad Vashem is that most survivors cannot speak, cannot tell their stories. And it was very, I couldn't tell my story. I lived in Yugoslavia for nine and a half years. I lived in Mexico 30 years. I never spoke about my experience. Not until 1997, uh, when the Shoah interviews were going on, sponsored by Steven Spielberg. In one of my trips to Mexico City, my brother Ivan said, I did my Shoah interview. You should do yours. And I said, no, I'm not going to do it because we all have the same stories. We were all taken to camps where they tried to kill us. We survived. And now we are here. All of us have the same story. And so my, bro my brother was quiet. The following month, I went to Mexico also. I used to go every month for a week. My brother said, Sunday at 11 o'clock, you have an appointment for your show I interview with Malka Izbitsky. <laughs> so I couldn't say no. At 11 o'clock on Sunday, I went to Malka's home and I, she had a camera and they taped me and I spoke for, for the first time in my life. I spoke three hours about my childhood. And Malka was smiling once in a while because she had heard my brother's story, who was already 12, and she knew <laughs> the different stories. So she would smile whenever I would screw up and say, we were 350 in the camp, we were only 62 in the camp, and which I didn't know. I imagined this crowd. And, the, and then I said, there were many German soldiers in the camp guarding us, and there were no German soldiers, there were only couples. The German soldiers were guarding outside the camp, not, not us. And, and then 1997, nothing happened. I never spoke again to anyone until 2002. My granddaughter, who was already 12 years old, asked me to write a story. So I sat down a Sunday afternoon, I started writing and I wrote three pages. I sent it to her. She was doing a work for her school called Shorashim, which is the story of her family. And she included my story and her father's, uh, her, her father's side stories which were fascinating also. And she got the first place in her school. And the director of the school told who, a woman whom I know, whom I knew, she said, I read your story and I cried. Anyway, then nothing happened because I had to write it and I didn't have to talk. I forgot it. It wasn't important. The difficult thing is to speak, to tell my story. In 2007, this was already nine years after the show I interviewed, the granddaughter of my wife, Lola, said, I used to be able to speak about this in very small groups, three or four people, family reunions, but never openly to, to public. And so Lola told me, you know, it's a month of the Holocaust in Los Angeles. Would you come to my classroom to tell us the story that you have said here at home? So what can I say? Of course, I said yes. So two weeks later, three weeks later, I went to her classroom and I want to, I've prepared a slide presentation with the whole story which I try, you cannot make it funny, but I tried to make it entertaining. It wasn't the, oy vey, we, we suffered so much. And I showed it to them. They were 12 year old kids, sixth, sixth grade elementary school. 
And uh, two weeks later, Lola said, you were right. Another woman came to our classroom to give us her story, also a survivor, and she sat on the desk, she covered her face, and she, all she said, I very, we suffered so much. I, we suffered so much. She didn't even raise her eyes to look at us. So you were right. You, your story was entertaining. Uh, ever since then, I have given these lectures to high school kids, to not to elementary, they're too young, but in Jewish schools, mainly in Mexico, I've given the speech maybe 12 times, 13 times. And after the second or third time, I became cruel. Literally, I became cruel because I would, the classroom usually had 40, 50 people. Uh, the principal of the school and some teachers would be in the audience. And before they darkened the room so I could show the presentation on the screen, I would ask the kids, who was born in July? And usually four or five children would raise their hands and say, I was born in July. I would tell them, okay, stand up and go to the side of the room and stand there. And so I would start the, the slides and about 15 or 20 minutes, I would tell them, okay, you can go sit down. And I would tell them, the reason you're standing there is because you were born in July, no other reason. And of course, the message was, you were sent to a camp because you were Jewish, no other reason. <laughs> One of those times I forgot about the kids and they were standing there for 45 minutes. And one of the kids in the audience, not the ones that were standing, said, why are they standing there? Why do you keep them there? <laughs> I forgot about them. Uh, then, it, so it became easier and easier to speak about it. Uh, I read that 90% of survivors cannot talk about their, their experiences. And my process was very slow with, uh, with the show interview and then my granddaughter and then my wife's granddaughter. And so it became easy and now it's easy. I cry once in a while, but it's easy. <laughs> uh, basically, that's my story. If you have any questions, I would love to answer them. Thank you so much for sharing with us this very moving uh, story. Uh, you're an absolutely charismatic speaker and it was really very moving. I, I having watched the film, I, I wanted to ask you about the seven times of uh, that you won the lottery. So you already answered this question yourself. And uh, if I may, I will, I will uh, ask um, a couple of questions and if there are more in the chat, uh, you're more than welcome to place them. Um, can, you, can you tell us a bit about um, life in, in uh, Hungary, about uh, um, moments that you um, felt anti-Semitism, uh, if there were incidents that you would like to uh, share with us, this is one question. And, um, uh, and then um, I will, of course, I want to, I, I wrote down all these dates that you mentioned, the 97, which was the very first time that you spoke. And then 2007, and uh, the, the film with Yad Vashem was done very recently, but we are very proud to have it. And we are currently translating it in many languages, Serbian, uh, very soon is the first one to come in. Uh, maybe also in Turkish. Um, so it is, um, you said all of us, we, we had the same story and this is one of the reasons why you didn't see the reason in, in sharing it at the beginning. Um, however, as you, as you very well said 
a very big percentage of survivors did not want to share their story. And uh, there have been different reasons, among them family reasons, like in the case of the grandchildren, that made them open up and, and come in front of audiences and, and share the story. So um, I would like to, to ask you a little bit about Hungary and also about um, what was the level of awareness? I mean, your, your parents, uh, what, what did the community know about the events that were transpiring? And if, if they had any knowledge and what made them um, stay? For, for so long, uh, why didn't they decide to, to leave also earlier? Uh, well, there was, uh, you mentioned anti-Semitism and in the documentary, I tell a story of my first personal experience with anti-Semitism. Uh, Solopica is a small city where six-year-olds are able to walk anywhere within 10 blocks to home. And uh, my mother asked me to go get a bottle of milk. She, she gave me a, an empty bottle. I walked, I don't know, four or five blocks to the, to the store where I bought the milk. And I had the bottle, oh, wait. We had to wear yellow stars. And I remember my mother saw uh, yellow stars and she put one on my blue sweater and I was wearing, I, we had in public, we had to wear the stars. So I went to the store to buy the milk. I got the bottle of milk and walking back home, I saw on the street, on the other side of the street, two boys, older than I was. And when they saw me, they started crossing the street. And I said, I know I, now something bad is going to happen. And I was right. They beat me up. I dropped the bottle, broke the glass, and the milk got spilled on, uh, on the sidewalk. And I went home crying and I told my mother that the story, and I told her that I broke the, the glass with milk. And I expected to her, of her to give me a spanking because I broke the glass. And I didn't break, so, but instead of that, she hugged me. And I didn't understand why she hugged me. She should have spanked me because I broke the glass of milk. Anyway, that's it. my first anti-Semitism experience. And since then, probably all of you and me have experienced many, many instances, instances of anti-Semitism. Uh, anyway, that was your question. And then, I forgot what sorry, I was muted, I'm sorry. So also about the level of awareness about the historical events that were about to transpire, the community on the family level, if you have I, any memories. I was not aware myself. I was not aware of politics or what was going on. I knew that we were in danger most of the time. My parents probably knew what was going on, but they didn't have any, I don't think they had any details of what was going on. There was no information about what was going on in the war in France or in, uh, in Russia. Uh, so I think they knew what was going on, but I didn't until- You mentioned, you mentioned dear Peter earlier about the Jewish princess uh, who uh, was, was ready to go even before. You mentioned also before the before deportations, she, uh, there was a plan to, to leave to Mexico at because some they, point. No, they, when they got married, they knew that there was, there was anti-Semitism everywhere in Europe. Mm -hmm. There was no aggression, there was no war, but there was anti-Jewish uh, demonstrations everywhere. And because, and that's why they named us 
with the names of the apostles. They didn't name us Moshe or Freke or, or Boran or uh, Lajos. The most popular names in the world. And so because they knew that they were not going to stay there the whole lives. And then uh, they were right. They did stay there the whole lives. And, uh, but that's, that's, uh, that's a reason. Uh, if they had listened to their friends in New York, they would have been able to send for us. But then uh, after like in 1941, 42, in 1941, my father got a letter from the uh, American embassy granting a visa for the whole family providing these three things that you have to accomplish. One of them, to open a trust of $10,000 that would give us like $300 a month for 10 years. My father had no problem. She could open the trust with $10,000. Number two was uh, provide tickets to go from Hungary, Yugoslavia to America, and which was impossible, and which was possible, my father had the money to buy train tickets to France, train tickets to the coast, boat tickets, he, he had money to do that. But the third one was impossible, uh, transit visas. France was already German, uh, uh, Belgium, Belgium was already German, Hungary was already German. So there was no way, even if we had the tickets, we couldn't go, we couldn't get the visas. So 15 days after that uh, letter is when the Germans bombed Belgrade. So they did have the intention of leaving, but it was too late. They should have done it in 1939. Uh, I, I have one more question, but this will be for the conclusion. Um, may I proceed, Lisa and uh, Jackie? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, okay. So um, before thanking you once again, um, I would like to, to request uh, your message, uh, a message of you as, as uh, Peter Rosenfeldspan, as a Holocaust survivor for our audience, for all the people who, who are with us tonight, both here on Zoom and on YouTube. Uh, um, uh, and for the broader public. Other, other, I'm sorry, if I may, other than your mother's command, not to run. <laughs> I, uh... Before the Yad Vashem uh, presentation a few days ago, I got into the Zoom half an hour before. And we were discussing, I said, that's the most difficult question. What do I tell younger people of the next generation? And so I told them the most difficult, thing, that's the most difficult uh, question. And I have two choices to answer. One of them is to talk about evil. I have this wonderful book about evil written by an Argentinian author, an older man that lives in Mexico. And it's not translated because it's impossible to translate. The title of the book is uh, Towards a General Theory about the, in Spanish, it's hijos de puta, son of horse. But in any language, it's not as hard as hijos de puta. A hijo de puta is 10 times worse than a son of a bitch or a son of a whore. And so they, were, they never translated. I love the book, I devoured it. I, I finished it over a year ago. 
Uh, I could talk about that, but Perla said, no, we don't want you to talk about the evil. Oh, the book is, is evil inherited? Is in evil learned? Or is it biological? Uh, very interesting. Uh, but I can tell you only one, one quote from the book. Abby Hoffman was a hippie philosopher that lived from 1936 to 1989. And he said, if men were made to eat, had to eat everything they kill, there would be no more wars in the world. And I, it's amazing. If men were had to eat everything they kill, there will be no more wars in the world. So that's the only thing I can say. And the, my other choice was to talk about anti-Semitism. And uh, they, Derla and Eliana, they all said, yeah, talk about anti-Semitism. And uh, just six days ago, in Mexico, there was a university professor that said to her class, in her class, there was only one Jewish girl, all the other ones who are not Jewish. She told the Joe, and I'm, I'm going to tell you the, the question, but I'm not going to tell you the answer. She said, what's the similarity or the difference between a, a pizza and a Jew. And her Jewish pupil stood up and left the classroom. And all the other ones accused her of being anti-Semitic. And they told the principals of the university. Anyway, then they ended up kicking her out of the university. And then five days before that was the Texas synagogue where this crazy guy held the six or seven people that were in the synagogue, held them hostage for 11 hours. And it turns out that the rabbi threw a chair to, this, uh, to the assailant. And then the FBI was already there aiming and they killed the guy. So we have anti-Semitism everywhere, all the time, nonstop. And the, the only way to get rid of it is education, to educate everybody, Jews, non-Jews, everybody, not to say anything derogatory about Jews, about Christians, about Catholics, about Muslims. Everybody should be respected. That's a, it's not much of a, uh, not much of a philosophy, but that's, that's all I can say. It is very much of a philosophy at the same time. Uh, you know, when, when I was contacted by uh, J JCC Izmir and by Lisa and Jackie a um, couple of weeks ago in order to organize this event, and the, the, the question that I asked them was, you know, what, what is the audience? What, what is the, the purpose I understood, of course? This is the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. So uh, Jackie told me, you know, it is, um, it is for us. It is for the Jewish community of Izmir and beyond. And it is for the broader public. And the aim is to raise awareness. So I, I suppose, and I'm, I'm certain that we fulfilled this goal, thanks to you tonight. Lisa, you have one more question. It was addressed to you in uh, Turkish. If you can translate for us, please. Yes, exactly. Thank you for your uh, sharing for your story and for inspiring us with your, especially with your last comments and your bravery. There has been one question about the, regarding the names you mentioned, because you said uh, your parents didn't name you either Jewish names, Hungarian names or Yugoslavian, and they knew that they were not going to stay there for so long. And I was wondering, how did this impact you in terms of identity and outlook on life 
because I think many people in Turkey and elsewhere can relate to this, how it is perceived when your name is different. I never knew, I never even knew this story until I was older. Uh, when I was born, my birth certificate says Petar in Serbian or Peter in Hungarian. And then when I arrived in Mexico, I was Pedro. For 30 years, I was Pedro. Everybody that met me while I was in Mexico, still today, they call me Pedro and I, I accept that. And then when I moved to California, I became Peter. And everybody that met me after 1976 calls me Peter because they met me here. So I was never conscious about this. This story was, uh, I learned this story about the, the apostles when I was a young man. It wasn't when I was a baby. It wasn't when I was seven years old or 10 years old. Thank you. Uh, there has been one more question, if, uh, if I can go. Um, you mentioned that you came from a very happy and loving family. We also see that in the film. Uh, did you feel this, uh, that, that your family was still loving and happy after the war as well? Did it change anything? Well, I would, I would call it loving today, but I always felt protected. It's not the loving. I always felt protected by my by brothers because I was a little baby and uh, protected by my parents because I was the little one. So I always felt protected. I never felt unsafe. My mother was there all the time. Every time I wanted to ask something or I needed my mother, she was there all the time. The only time where she was not there was in Strasbourg. That's why I cried for three days nonstop. But I, I always felt safe. I've always felt protected. And uh, we, we are always with one last question. So this, yes. with your permission, uh, a last question, it was uh, addressed to me. This question for your information, Peter came from Greece this time. Okay. Uh, and it is even uh, written in Greek. So um, Odette is asking how the Sephardic background um, affected the choice of uh, Mexico. Um, would you think that it was, it was due to, uh, wh why Mexico and not some other uh, country, um, even in 41 and later on? Uh, my mother, my mother's family were six girls and one boy. And the boy ran away when he was 26 years old or 27 years old. He ran away. If I was him, I would run away from six sisters. <laughs> and he appeared in Mexico, in Mexico uh, in 1932. I don't know what adventures he had, but he arrived in Mexico and he was living in Mexico in 1939 when my, the reason, oh, they were very religious. The, my grandfather made all the girls sit Shiva because whenever a boy left home or escaped from home, he was dead. So the rest of the family had to sit Shiva, like if he was dead. So my mother told us that they cried, all the sisters sat and cried all week long because they had to, but they really loved their brother. And after a few months, he sent a letter and they started corresponding with him. And that's why in 1939, they decided to go to Mexico to visit him. And he was the reason why Mexico. Uh, I, we could ask more and more questions. Thank you for this really fascinating uh, I, talk. I want to tell you something that it's not a question. Uh, yesterday, we had a meeting just like this 
for Mexico, Mexicans. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the conversation, I said that for many, many years, I've been thinking why people cannot talk about their experience. I, I have asked myself for years and years, why don't pe why people cannot talk about it? And I came to a conclusion for the first time, not a conclusion, an answer for myself about three months ago. It's like having been raped in public. So if you have been raped in public, it's impossible that you can tell the story. And uh, for myself, just imagine I was raped in public when I was six years old. That's why I couldn't talk. And that's why most people, I think this is my answer. I don't think there is an answer, but I accept it as my answer. The reason people cannot talk about it is because of what I just said. Just imagine a 20 year old or 25 year old that went to Auschwitz and survived. He cannot tell the story when he was 50 years old or 60 years old. Uh, I also said a story about when I did my Shoah interview, uh, Malka, the interviewer, made a mistake. I think still today, I think she made a mistake by telling me a story. Before I started talking, she said that a week before she had an older man for the first time in his life, telling the story, and he he collapsed, and they didn't know what to do. They had to call an. They didn't know how to revive him, and they had to call an ambulance. And they took an ambulance came and they took him to a hospital. His story. This man in his fifties, he never told the story to his older children or grandchildren. He was 18 or 20 years old when the long marches started, when the Germans made all the Jews from the camps go into long marches to either die by themselves or kill them during the marches. And he said that he told a story for the first time in his life that he had a brother, they were very close, and they were walking together, and his, his brother was cold. He was all the time cold, and it was freezing. It was winter. And in one of the stops, his brother sat down on a stone, and he died frozen. He saw, I have to cry. He, he saw his brother freeze to death. He never told the story to his children or to his wife or to anyone until the show I interviewed with Malke. And when she told me this, I said, oh, she, she, she should have told me. I never went through the, something like that. But anyway, that's why, uh, how can you tell that story? Uh, years later, a few years later, I was having lunch at a friend's house, an older woman who had been friends with my mother, and we were talking about this, and one of her, one of these ladies' uh, daughter-in-law said, that was my father. <laughs> but, you know, she had never heard the story. Anyway, just an idea. Why why can't people talk about it? And now, every day, every year, there are less and less of us, and most of us were children when when the show happened.
Anyway, now you can say goodbye. <laughs> I cannot. We are we are lacking between brackets to be the last ones to be able to to hear first-hand testimonies and um, also within. Um, Within my my work in in the International School for Holocaust Studies in Yad Vashem, we are we keep trying to find substitutes, if I may say so, to this um, first hand uh, uh, testimony, which is it, it is indeed very very hard to to find substitutes and find a way to to substitute this immediate. A way of uh, receiving, getting knowledge about the, the events, also the historic events, and also how how the big history with a capital H does affect the individuals uh, and and each one uh, individual's life in a very um, direct, significant, marking way. Dear Rosenfeld Span, thank you so much. It was a great honor to have you with us. Uh, thank you, um, this distinguished guests, for staying with us and listening to our story, for getting connected. I'm looking forward to having more occasions. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Jakey. It was a beautiful opportunity, and it was a very unique way to honor this International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And uh, for whoever wants to uh, watch the film, it is on um, YouTube, it is on Yad Vashem uh, webpage. And uh, I, I, um, Jackie, you already put it again, like there's a reminder, my mother told us not to run. Yes. Uh, and uh, also in Spanish. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Peter and everyone for this uh, event. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Pleasure. We have the honor, exactly. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a good evening. Have a good morning. evening. <laughs> have a good Bye. evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Lisa, how do you say good night in Turkish? <laughs> <laughs>